Hello and welcome to Rugger Matrix International. I'm your host, Jero Sen. Had a week off, but here he is again, Ben Kimber. Good to see you, mate. Jero, how are you, buddy? Very good. Uh, no, you're not feeling too well tonight. I'm all right, mate. I'll, I'll soldier through. All right, very good. And in between us is a good old mate of mine from the Waratahs, old days, Mark Sturbina. Mark, you're in America now, I know, because I helped sign a document to get you there. <laughs> <laughs> but if you don't uh, remember, Mark played in the uh, French premiership as well with the French competition with Beer Ritz, state of that place as well and of course you played over in the UK and uh, you had a pretty severe neck injury, you broke your neck and uh, but you're thankfully okay. Thank you. And uh, great to see you. Thanks Jiro, great to be here. Viewers, how are you doing? <laughs> it's been a long time, I think I was on Rugger Matrix. Uh, two... Yeah, you're there, you're there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, some some, some you, time ago. You missed the big part of his CV, mate. He's an old Sydney boys high boy oh, with me. <laughs> old schoolmates. Oh, oh dear. Of course, here. of course. You can reminisce after the show. We've got 30 <laughs> minutes to do a, a cracking program. And we've been off for a week uh, to recharge our batteries. And, and the reason we've got uh, Mark in is that uh, not only did you back to say hello and uh, had a sort of coming home party, but you're very much involved with the game in America. We do have an American podcast, but it's great to, to have your thoughts particularly on a few things coming up in international rugby, Mark, as a, yeah. as a coach now and a uh, pretty fit sort of fella. So we'll get, we'll get you in the moment about that sort of stuff. But sure. Ben Kimber, let's get straight to it. What is Ben Kimber's strike issue of the week? So uh, last show before Christmas, I want to make sure we wrap it up nicely. We've had a lot of themes running sh through the show this year, a lot of stuff to talk about. But what I would really like to do this show is the issue of the week or the issues of the week, I want to pick the Rogue Matrix best of, mate. I want to name our best team of the year, our best player of the year and our best game of the year to start with. And we'll see what that bleeds into. We might get into some other stuff as well. Oh, geez, I've got some thoughts about that, Ben. And uh, I think uh, we may as well start with the most controversial. What is that? I think the most controversial for you, there's a few yeah. of them probably. Uh, how about we start with coach of the year? Coach All of right? the year? Because I think that's pretty straightforward, but it could be, it could be fairly controversial. All right. Now, you uh, want to have a go at this as well, mate? I, I'm just happy to listen and uh, weigh in, <laughs> weigh in with uh, well, my we, thoughts. We want your opinion too on, on, because we, we, we very much see this from the outside, right? You've both been inside teams, but for me and most of the viewers, we watch it from the outside and and seeing what a coach can do with a team. Uh, there was some controversy from New Zealand, our New Zealand fans last year, over the naming of Michael Checker as the 2015 coach of the year. Yeah, just some. Yeah, and look, I I didn't have a problem with it. I still think that was the right pick because it's not about the t the guy that coaches the number one team. It's about the guy who gets the best results out of his team. Otherwise, you give it to the number one team every year. It's about the coach who you see what they have and what they've molded and what they get out of that. And in 2015, yep, the All Blacks won the World Cup, but they were the number one side already. Australia had Checker turn up out of nowhere, get get the uh, the rugby championship trophy, and then take the team you know, unheralded really, all the way to the World Cup final. Now this year, massive year of rugby, a lot of games. I am going to give it to Hanson this year. I'm going to follow the IRB in on this one, or World Rugby in on this one. I just think the way that in a, what's a lull year normally after a World Cup, the way that he brought that team together and the run they had, that one hiccup, you know, clearly. But I think what a great coaching year for Hanson, and I think he was my coach of the year. Well, if you take Hanson's effort to get to the World Cup final and win it last year and then continue on then certainly you'd give it to him. But for this year, the calendar year, I'm giving it to Eddie Jones, my old mate Eddie, because what he's done with England, unbeaten year. Steve Hansen, unbeaten? Missed one. Correct. Mm. So he's missed one, and uh, Eddie Jones has done what this England team hasn't done for a long time and win a whole year unbeaten. And uh, it's getting closer, it's taking a while, till they beat, meet the All Blacks, but uh, the... All backs have gone down a peg due to Ireland. So I think Eddie Jones, for me, is the coach of the year. Mark Stabina, as that flying outside back for the Waratahs <laughs> many years ago, who would you go for? I like, I like Ben's, I, I like his synopsis on, on Hanson. I, I, I agree with what you're saying there. And um, Oh, well, this show's over. Hang on, <laughs> hang on, Jiro. All right. However, Ben. <laughs> I have to go with Eddie as well, and it might be oh, a little. Yeah, you stuck it. Might be, it might be a little. <laughs> it might be a little biased um, knowing Eddie and, and actually having been coached by Eddie. He's a fantastic coach, and, and just almost knowing. I can just imagine him going into that camp and knowing whatever issues he needed to mm. uh, creases he needed to iron out um, to have an unbeaten season with that team. Uh, it just seems like most things that Eddie touches turn, turn to gold and. 
I think that was an example of, of his coaching ability. Just not just unbeaten though, Mark and Ben, he, he beat Australia four times. Yeah. To beat one team as good as Australia four times in one year is a monument, monumental effort for a Northern Hemisphere team. For a Northern Hemisphere team, yep. The All Blacks also knocked them over three times and the, you know, the season struggle as the Springboks even knocked over Australia. Mm. Um, but just back on Eddie, uh, Mark, do you, do you, like, there's, you know, famously he got um, punted as Australian coach some time ago. You have been coached by Eddie. Do you think he's a different coach now? I mean, he, I think he says himself he feels like he's matured as a coach. Do you see anything different in him or the way he conducts himself or the way his teams play? Well, one thing about Eddie is he, he constantly strives for, for growth in himself. He, um, he's a student of the game and he is uh, a fantastic analyst. Um, and he's not shy to admit his downfalls, and, and I know that he works extremely hard to better himself. Now, when I say I was coached by him, that was nearly 15 years ago. Um, it's hard to tell how he conducts himself behind the scenes. Obviously, you know, all I see are the interviews and things like that, and he hasn't really changed too much. <laughs> he's pretty deadpan he, when he... Uh, when, he's when mellowed he, a bit. He, he has mellowed a bit, and I think... When you refer to uh, his reign with Australia, I, I, I do remember some comments um, when he first took on the Wallabies. He's a very intense guy. Uh, and he came into a camp which was fairly relaxed, um, uh, had a lot of players that he normally used to coach, but I think he just felt the need to take it to another level. And for some people, that was too much, and they, they didn't yeah. know how to handle that. Well, I've uh, sat down with a couple of players in the past, and we've had a couple of quiet beers, and we've sat and said so. Who's your favourite coach? Who's the best coach you've worked with? And it's a really tough question. I mean, Lottie was the one. Hey, you got to make a decision. You've got to make a decision. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and I've worked with uh, Rod McQueen, uh, Bob Dwyer. We both worked with Bob Dwyer. Yes. Um, Eddie Jones. Uh, Chris Hickey, too, worked with him. Um, but in the end, I had to say that Eddie Jones was the best coach I worked with because he, he was the one who went the extra mile to analyse the play and he worked on those relationships relationships but Mark you made a really good point when he's wrong he he, he admits he's wrong you have a almighty take him something to get yeah, there sometimes? yes no. you have an almighty <laughs> battle to find him out so I, I actually made a mistake once in a, in a team meeting where I said oh, I was a few guys doing this and he goes which guys <laughs> And he go, oh, if it's not, name names. And then I thought, oh, why did I say that? I don't know. I got out of it somehow. The school teacher came This is where I got you and McKinsey in trouble. We were sitting there just having a conversation. And I said, you know, no one really, and this is my sort of science stuff coming out. And I said, why doesn't someone just do a side-on shot at a super slow-mo and with a big graph behind the line out to work out exactly what happens, a really fine detail at super slow-mo. And so, you know, we had a, Eddie goes, yeah, that's a good idea. Link and Ewan, why haven't you done that, mate? <laughs> so I, and Link goes, oh, thanks a lot. So I got him into trouble. So sometimes it wasn't a good idea to have an idea with Eddie. But when he had a gripe against a player, he would then, if that player performed, change his mind and pick them. Other coaches I know, and, and there'd be one of those guys and I listed, would hold a grudge against them and never pick them. Right. Yeah, he was, he was fair. Uh, I mean, I think of all the coaches I've had, uh, and one thing about Eddie is you always knew where you stood with him. Mm. He, he was consistent with his philosophy. So if he said, mate, I'm going to drop you, mate. If you don't <laughs> play well this way, he'll, he'll drop you. He, and, he, and he won't. He was he, straight. Yeah, he was straight mm. and, and, and fair. So you knew where you stood. You knew what was expected of you. And, and he stuck to that. And I think it's all about, especially at that level, it's all about respect from your players. Are yeah. you still doing the Homer Simpsons? Oh. Juro, I thought we were over that, mate, but uh, it's... Well, you brought it up, mate. You went to go hard in that right. idiot. Let's ask Homer to close the show yeah. then, all right? Yeah, we'll yeah, ask yeah, Homer. Right. Homer, at the end of the show, we want to wrap. Now, just, just there on Eddie, right? And, and it's really interesting to always get insight from guys who've actually played with him. Mm -hmm. And I think it, 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 is, it is quite... I can see how you can mount an argument for him as coach of the year, right? Uh, undefeated Grand Slam. What was your order? Did you have a second place? Oh, I'm, no, I'm just going to talk you down from Eddie uh, first, yeah. right? right? <laughs> but, you know... You know hey, a, a hey Eddie Slam, admits when he's wrong, mate. Yeah. But he also, I think, I think he knows who they pick as coach of the year. He had a couple of digs at Checker over that coach of the year drive because I think Eddie thinks he's pretty good too. But he had, uh, clearly, Grand Slam. England hadn't done it in some time. Great effort, that. Moved into an unprecedented three-zip win in Australia. Um, you know, really set that standard and then moved on to another undefeated home run. An excellent and outstanding season for England. And clearly, Eddie's got them in the right shape. So I can, I can understand your argument. But I've got to look at the All Blacks. I've got to see Steve Hansen, who came out of a World Cup year, who lost, 
Richie McCaw, who lost Dan Carter, Kevin Mialama, all these names of guys who were Titans. And he's got that team humming so much that they came in and they didn't just compete. You know, admittedly, we've talked about the Wallabies and the Springboks weren't as you know good as we've seen them in the past. Yeah. But they didn't just compete. They smashed them. They yeah. smashed them. Yeah. And they had an astonishing year. I think you've got to give it to Hanson. Oh, he had a great year, but he loses a couple of points for me for the effort in, uh, in Chicago, where, and particularly in selection. Yeah. So uh, I just think Eddie... Look, Hanson is great. They're both great coaches, but you know we have to make a decision. You've called for the right. coach of the year, and I'm going for Eddie. Steve Hanson, a very close second. All right. It's all right if you're wrong, mate. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> sulking. Is he sulking? A little bit. No, a little bit. A bit. <laughs> Let's talk about player of the year, okay? Right. I'd, I'd like to award the player of the year, and, and I think those of you who are regular on our Facebook page... I think study, I don't know who you want. We get... Um, we get Plenty of good comments from uh, people around the world on our page. They always get stuck in and we get a lot of smart comments. Those of you who are on our Facebook page regularly, you know who I believe the Player of the Year was. There were five nominees for the IRB World Rugby Player of the Year. Um, the winner was Bowden Barrett. Uh, I don't think you can pick a guy who, who isn't as good as the bloke who took his jumper previously. Well, that's not really a fair comment. But I, no, I think Barrett's got some improvement in him is my point. My Player of the Year, and it was by some margin, Dane Coles. Mm. Dane Coles, All Blacks hooker. I saw a guy who I think almost single-handedly reinvented the hooker role. I mean, there's been all this talk for some months now about what is the gap, right, between the All Blacks game that they play and the game that the Wallabies, the Springboks, everyone else is playing. What's the gap? And one of the big talking points is always skill in the forwards. Mm -hmm. Now, Stabby, in your, in, in, you know, in your day, I don't think we, we saw forwards who were as skillful as we see today. The game's, you know, moved on. But Dane Coles, if you're going to talk about one guy, who, is, who, is, who epitomises that, his, his play out wide, his ball handling, his support play, he is like another back, but he's in the, in the body of a forward and he plays a forwards game. So he was my international player of the year. I agree with you. I mean, we've talked Oi. about... Uh, this is well, unusual. It's, it's pretty Captain Obvious, though. Like, we, oh, have, we have been... Not uh, according to the IRB. I don't think you've seen much of Dane Coles' uh, effort this year, mate. But Absolutely. F uh, he can... His passing game, athleticism... And, but he does the, the tight five stuff really well. I mean, he's like the perfect player. Yeah, yeah, all around player, you're right. And, and, and it's funny, when, you, when he gets the ball, it, it, it takes you a little while to realise it's actually a hooker. Um, it's always a pleasure to see, uh, you know, forwards that can play like a back. As you said, I'm just repeating what you said, but I have to agree with you there. It's, um, he, he is, I just, when I watch the All Blacks with my buddies, I just go on what I see. And when I, when I watch it with a few of my mates over in America, it's, it's like... It's, geez, it's that Coles again, he's, yeah. you know, and just the comments that we make going on that. And Barrett is, he's the other one, I've got to say. And we comment a lot on um, just, you're right, he's got some improvements. He's a young guy, um, but he's one, he, his pace is what kind of being a back myself and knowing, you know, being impressed by athleticism. Yeah. Um, and Dane Coles is impressive. Uh, his athleticism is impressive for a forward. Yeah. But out and out, I think Barrett, probably is one of the quickest players in the game across the yeah, board. Yeah. And it's a pleasure to watch. So just from that, you know, Barrett, his skill, his vision, um, but it has to be Coles. Yeah, yeah so Coles, absolutely. Unanimous. Yeah, yeah, yes, uh, he thoroughly deserves it. And, of course, there are many other great players throughout the year. But uh, I think the, the, the overwhelming consensus is that from this panel, he deserved it. And all the great teams have great hookers. And that's, uh, that is absolutely without a doubt. Um, but, you know, um, there is time for Barrett to grow. And I think th that, you know, we've said over the fullness of time, I think he will be, he'll be up there. But, yeah, it's too early to judge, as Ben says, yeah. if he's the equal of Dan Carter. Yeah. Next. And I think, I think that, you know, you know, and maybe I'll give you a point here for your Eddie Jones uh, argument. Jeez, you don't um, hold a grudge. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, when you look at that England side, I don't really look at that side and, you know, maybe I told you, I told you uh, who was out for really for the games that we saw towards the end of the year. Not many of them would you say are uh, stand up, World 15, have to pick them straight away. Mm -hmm. So to that extent, Eddie Jones has done a great job of, sh of, of shaping those guys into a team. You know, less about some of the out and out wow. Uh, you know, Billy Von Apollo, I'm a big fan of oh. though. But really they don't have the, the guns that, you know, yeah. that New Zealand do. Uh, so on that, I just want to ask you about those names we just talked about in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, when, when the All Blacks uh, come to Chicago, what's, it, what's the, the mood like in rugby on the ground there in America? Is it start a bit of a you know, buzz? 
It definitely does. I mean, you're on the West Coast, but... Yeah, on the West Coast, but we... Having you know, wine and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> on the beach, mate. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I tell you, it, there's a big buzz, and, and you say I'm on the West Coast, but a lot of people that I know in that, that support rugby or youth coaches, they have their kids playing rugby, they buy their tickets and they fly to Chicago, and, and it's, it's, it's one of those events they look forward to. Um, the Ireland-New mm. Zealand game was no exception, and especially after that first game. The fact that they... Uh, sold out an NFL stadium was big news, actually big news in American news. And it's a novelty factor. And they really, uh, I think it was great for rugby because they would have news stories uh, a, a lot, especially local news in Chicago, here are the All Blacks. You've got to understand, um, America knows the All Blacks. They don't know rugby that well. But they, it's a big brand. It, it is a brand. Yeah. yeah, it is. So it, it created a big brand. I'm going to ask you a bit more about that later on. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do have a rugby show in America that uh, Alex Goff and Bruce McLean host. Uh, there's a new one coming up tomorrow, by the way. Uh, ben, next uh, subject. Last one that I wanted to really touch on, mate, um, was the game of the year. Now, um, there was, if, if I could say, as a season of international rugby, and I think we've touched on this before, what a great season. Like to see some of the second and third tier nations taking steps up. Um, some upset victories, you know, Italy beating the Springboks, Ireland beating the All Blacks. Um, but really that competitive nature of some of the other nations, and I'm really keen to hear more from Stabby about what, you know, how he sees American rugby coming together, because we do talk about that as a potential sleeping giant. But as a season for international rugby, it really feels like the game's in a good place, with the exception of right at that top tier, where for, the All Blacks seem to have that gap on everyone. Um, until Chicago. And when we talked about coach of the year, I said it'll depend on your criteria, right? Is it, is it the coach who got the most out of what he had, etc.? For game of the year, my game of the year, it's about the amount of excitement I saw in the game. It's about the standard rugby I saw in the game. And that game in Chicago was it for me. Now, the All Blacks fan won't, won't agree with it. And some of our uh, viewers, our New Zealand viewers, have put a bit of stuff out there like, oh, it was an exhibition game. It wasn't an exhibition game. Steve Hansen took his squad over there. He made his selections. And in that game, he was missing a couple of guys as every other international team this year has at various times. Right? If they made errors in selection in hindsight, that's not the problem. That was a full strength test match and Ireland and the All Blacks went hammer and tongs. And the Irish game that game I thought was fantastic. They just executed everything to a T. And the way they hung on with their fingernails, it was exciting. So, you know, I'm a Wallabies fan. I'm just watching it for the joy of rugby and I enjoyed that game. Yeah, I think it was a great pulsating game. I'm going to compare it to the 2000 series, Australia-New Zealand, where the first game they called the greatest game of all, it was pretty much touch football. But the return game, where Australia won the Bledisloe Cup in Wellington, was a much better game of rugby. It was a tougher game, and I think I give the second test as New Zealand v Ireland as my game of the year because of the brutality, the toughness of it, the fact that the All Blacks repelled Ireland wave after wave, and Ireland threw everything at them. It was a great uh, contest, and it was at a great venue, the old Lansdowne Road, Aviva Stadium. So uh, once again, it's, a, a, it's Ireland v New Zealand. They're the new sort of superpowers, well, and, and see, I think, yeah. When you see two good teams going hammer and tongs, yeah. I mean, Stabby, I mean, you've seen a lot of international rugby over years. What do you think of the standard at the moment that, that's at the top level there and, and the way that, that sort of developed, particularly, you know, to see a team that, like the All Blacks that was playing such a, a higher plane mm -hmm. to actually get taken down by an Irish team, had to really pick it up. How, how do you think that the style and the standard is at the moment? It just keeps getting better and better every year. That goes without saying, I think. Um, but when you mention those games, you can't help uh, but, but incorporate the backstory of those games. Um, you, you, you just, if you look at a game from face value, you look at the score, you look at the closeness, but you can't ignore the fact that that game and the build-up, you asked me about the build-up, it was a massive build-up. This is Ireland's chance. You know, that's all. I have Irish buddies in, in, uh, in LA, and it's all the talk. So there was an anticipation behind that game already. And, and the fact that it, it didn't disappoint just added to that, and it was a fantastic game. I, I, I'm not sure this is the, the best game of the year for me, but I just I want to mention that Ireland, again, Ireland, they've had a fantastic year. I think that Wallabies Ireland match was an exciting game for me. I, I, it was. It was, it, yeah. it, it, was a, it was a fantastic game, and I really enjoyed it as a game of rugby. Um, and there was not as big a backstory behind it, but I want to give that just a mention, you know. Uh, but you can't ignore the fact that that Chicago game was, uh, you went for the second game. Yes. I have to agree with Ben on the first game. Yeah. And I think, and to your point on the, on the Wallabies Island game, 
Um, you know, it depends on your criteria. Yeah. So like that game, Heart, the Heart Island showed in that game to beat the Wallabies when they lost three or four backs. Yeah. Um, and the Wallabies were playing probably some of their best continuity football of the year and really stretching them and they had to scramble and then they lifted in that last 10 minutes. And this is after getting bashed by the All Blacks the week before. So it's a really good point. That, that showed a lot of tick of that game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it certainly did. Mark, uh, the things we noticed out of the Ireland team, well, good mate Les Kiss, who's moved on from the Ireland setup, but set a lot of the foundations for the defensive uh, alignments and their, com- their combative nature at the tackle itself mm. up at Ulster Way now. But they, they, they instituted a couple of techniques that um, really um, have kept the man in play uh, a lot longer. Uh, are you surprised that... Um, that Ireland is sort of leading the way in that regard, or do you, you put it all down to Les Kiss? I wouldn't put it all down to, to Les Kiss, but... <laughs> he told me to say that. <laughs> <laughs> of course he did. Uh, that's a very good point. And, and you know, at that level, um, this is where, you know, coaches earn their stripes. It's the players, you're at such a high level, the players know how to play rugby. It's about squeezing that 1% out of, out of the players to get the edge over the opposition. And, and um, for a coach to be able to find, you know, reinvent certain parts of the game and, and have the players buy into that, um, certainly Ireland displayed that. And, um, you know, he's, he's implemented that technique and, uh, and it shows. Just those little details when you add them up over the game can make a big difference. Just on that point, you talk about that 1%. One of the conversations we've had in the past few shows has been around, you know, it started to sort of come out. We've talked about the Wallabies this year, right, what hasn't worked for them. And one of the things that we think that they probably, you know, from, from looking at the way they're playing is they, they haven't quite got the rugby smarts going in the right direction. You know, Czech has always been very forward in saying he wants to play a certain style, right? They're running rugby the Australian way. And it just feels like a team that really wants to chase a style more than play the game in front of them. And that's the conversation we've had. And, and, it's, and it's felt like, uh, you know, in, in the Irish halves, the English halves, the All Black halves are doing a better game, better job of playing the game in front of them yeah. than the Wallabies who seem to lack a little bit of that, under, that, that focus on what's going to get us in front here or get us a slight edge, that, you know, those little one percenters. Yeah. Do you think that's a fair comment? I, I definitely think it's a fair comment, whether it necessarily applies to the Wallabies and the game they're playing. Um, you know, you can argue that, but I think to your point, you have to play to your strengths. Yeah. You can have an idea of the style you want to play and you want to make it uh, exciting for the crowds and put bums on seats again. Um, and, and it's great that, you know, Czech has come from that background, from from Randwick, the, the, running, the running rugby. And he has some good players to be able to do that and i think i agree with you they might not necessarily have the personnel yet or um you know have the buy-in that uh, that would be able to execute the game that he wants to play yeah and i suppose that's one of the other points we're discussing that you know the kicking game of australia in the halves isn't great right so it does lend itself to that uh running game and also then you know he he wants to keep his two world-class back rowers in there hooper and pocock again lends itself to a mobile running game Absolutely. Uh, you mentioned the kicking game. It's so important that uh, while you might want to have the running rugby, as you said, you've got to play what's in front of you. And what these other teams are doing well, your New Zealand's, your Ireland's, is they'll build the score early on when they need to build the score. When it's time to just settle things down and put points on the board, that can have a massive psychological edge over your opposition early on. You know, such high-level matches, yeah. so tense. Um, that's, I think I agree with you, where, where Australia don't manage that as well as the other teams. So just talking about Les Kissing, the, the choke tackle, which is basically to keep the player up. Um, and, you know, it's controversial. Yeah. And uh, the IRB is talking about, or World Rugby is talking about new laws, Ben. Yep. And the, the new tackle laws uh, really put pressure on referees now, fellas. And uh, I know you've had contact before that was probably accidental that led to your neck injury but yeah. are you are you positive does are you in a positive frame to see that the IB is moving this way or is this more about concussion uh, with shots going up high and hitting the head more onus on the def- on the tackler now to make sure that they don't make any contact with the head you're asking me yeah <laughs> well but yeah you know, I mean you're asking I'm, I'm asking you is are they still in the right path so they keep pushing all the way they have <laughs> I think you, you, you have to. I, you know, it's, it's not just about the game. For me, yeah. uh, and especially being in America, and I have to talk about it now, but it's interesting what they're going through over there in the States to try and build the game. 
it's not just about the game for, for the viewers at the top level. It's about game. It's about participation yeah. as well. It's yeah. about getting grassroots building. It's about getting parents to want to put their kids in and feel that it's a safer game than other contact sports. So I'm sure that that's factored into the new laws. Um, but, you know... Because I, it was pretty scary for you, wasn't it? I, I broke my neck, yeah. yeah. I, I, again, and in the aftermath. In the very, aftermath. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think back to not even that, the times where I had concussion. And, and it's, you know, the, the different... Now the different measures of, of when there's suspected concussion. Um, I got... C very frustrated as a coach just at, at amateur level in in america back in my day back in our day when we mm. played um it'd be like you get your bell rung and it'd be like ah you're right make it back out get there, back out there yeah. now we're seeing 10 years on we're seeing the repercussions mm. of that so obviously you have to now you can't ignore that yeah. you want to make it a safe game um and one might argue particularly when you're in a position as a coach where the player seems okay mm. um but there's all these measures say get him off the field straight away. So there's sometimes there's a fine line. Uh, if you're not aware, Mark uh, was uh, with uh, Newport Gwent Dragons, mm -hmm. um, and you'd played at Beerits and you'd played um, with the Blues too, the Cardiff oh, Blues. But uh, just quickly, just can you recap what happened to you? Yeah, when I was playing, uh, I was playing in a Heineken Cup match for uh, Newport, and uh, we were playing against Toulouse in Toulouse. So it was a big game. And uh, it was, as I said, it was, it was accidental, but I was trying to make a tackle and, and it wasn't the best technique because I shifted onto a, another player that got the ball late. And as I was bringing him to the ground in kind of like a judo roll, uh, I had my head in close. Again, very poor, poor technique, kids. Uh, okay, you don't want to tackle like this. But uh, as I was falling to the ground, my feet came from under me and then two of my players hit that player from the side. And... As a result, all three players landed on the top of my head. My head went between my knees as I was sat on the ground and I heard the crack, I felt the crack, and then I was paralyzed for a good 25 minutes. But mm. luck, lucky to walk away. I, I, and, and it was lucky to be playing in a, a big town like Toulouse who had the best medical staff on hand, yeah. straight to the hospital. Uh, they're like the mafia there, Toulouse. You know, they're just uh, whatever you want, whatever you need. So they rushed me in, they had the best surgeon. I got operated on that night. It was actually, it was funny. I woke up on my birthday the next day in a, in a neck brace and like kind of, all right. But walked out of the hospital five days later. I was very lucky. A example here of a player who's been close to the edge and, uh, and thankfully you're through. You're looking fantastic, mate, by the way. Oh, is this, you where, must I, work is this out. where I say you are, you are too, <laughs> never, Gerard? You never says it to me. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, um, Gerard. So, uh, you, you look know, great. Oh, ben. thanks, Sam. No, so there is an example. I know a lot of people out there are saying, we, we still want a tough game. And, and if people are checking themselves going to tackles, maybe they'll get hurt as well. But there has to be some sort of responsibility for the head body to look after players. Yeah. Like now this, yeah. And, and yeah. The, the, these, these proposed law changes, or these law changes, they're coming um, from World Rugby, are massive. Like, I see massive implications for the game here. Like, the way that you look at the test matches that played out this year yeah. and the, the, the points in the game that, you know, became very formative. You know, think of Sam Kane hitting... Um, the Irish Centre, think of, you know, a few of the different times where there was contact and it may result in the yellow card. I just want to I'll quickly read the statement, but a player is deemed to have made reckless contact during a tackle or attempted tackle or during other phases of the game. If in making contact the player knew or should have known there was a risk of making contact with the head of an opponent. Now this means even hitting here and sliding up, yeah. which has always been forgiven. And it's going to mean a change to tackling techniques. It's going to have to. Guys are going to stop going high. They're going to stop going anywhere above the elbow, really, because the fear of getting here and sliding up, the onus is on the player who comes in to make the tackle. If they make contact with the head, what used to be maybe you know ignored will become a penalty. What was a penalty is going to be a yellow. What was a yellow will be a red. And what was a red will be some time out of the game. I mean, this is massive, don't you think, Stabby? It is massive. Uh... And it's funny, your point before, like I will watch a game with some old school rugby fans that are like, this is ridiculous, another penalty. You know yeah, what that's I mean? what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the spectacle is it's a combat sport and, uh, and the collisions are, you know, whether you like it or not, what draws people to the game as well. So they're diminishing more and more. You've seen, a, especially in the States, um, I mentioned to Ben before, you know, I, I know that they're making a big effort to try and make it safer. They want more kids to go into yeah. rugby than American football. There's concussion things, but uh, it, it will. As a coach, I'm just thinking now, it, I, I'm probably going to eliminate the tackle technique and, and practice of, of hitting here. Yeah. I'm going to be probably doing everything much lower yeah. so that you can keep it within the laws of the game. And what's that going to be? It's going to be more offload, surely, right? 
You got going quite a wrap up a player. This is exactly what I was going to jump in about because there is salvation here. Because, uh, you know, a couple of months ago, the the Wallabies Grand Slam Tour uh, highlights from 84 was doing the rounds. Some of the greatest rugby you'll ever see. It was wonderful stuff. And guess what? The contact back then is nowhere near as brutal as it is now. Because now it's just the, co- the collision zone is all about these big gym guys, isn't it, Mark? It's so, and you would have seen it over the years. Yeah. But back then... Uh, if you go back and look at the contact, it, it was nothing like that. No. And it was the game pl- was free and flowing yeah. and spectacular to watch. So I think the game will survive, but it, it will be a big change for the game. There is no doubt about it. It's funny, just sorry, Dura, on yeah. that point, um, I noticed the difference just playing in France. Um, there wasn't an emphasis on gym work at all. In fact, they didn't even know what they were doing. <laughs> it was all about playing with balls. They used to have hand. wine on a Saturday morning, didn't they? Well, yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and cigarettes yeah. and, uh, and cheese. But... <laughs> You would, and then I went to Northampton Saints the following year, and it was all about gym. These young yeah. guys, it was about, and it was about collisions and hits and yeah. power, and that kind of continuity that you yeah. see with the French teams was completely different. So, yeah, yeah a lot it's more. It's a game of balance, really, isn't it? We had yeah. this conversation with Brett Papworth when he talked about, you know, and Pappy was very clearly that player back in the day who was all about the silky lines, the hands, the, and that, and yeah. and the the gym, how it takes a few yards off in pace and how it might be a very different play that comes out the other side of the gym. Yeah, the gym should be, um, sup- they should supplement your play with gym work. It shouldn't be the dominating factor, but I've seen, and you would have seen it too, a lot of young 18 year olds just smash themselves in the gym all the time yeah. uh, and forgot how to play footy, mm-hmm. you know, while they were there in the first place. Uh, we'll get to comments in a moment. Uh, quick mention about the South African solution. Uh, we're going to hold that. We're, we're teeing up one of the legends from South Africa to be involved with that program. So my solution to fix the spring box You're a tease, mate. is coming. You're a tease. Tease. This will be good. I've always been a tease, haven't I, Mark? <laughs> Back to your day. Quick note uh, before we get to a couple of points you wanted to raise. Can check it, keep it together next year? Just, just briefly. Oh, look, briefly, I think, you know, I, I think Checker was lucky to get through there. And, and I think for those, again, on the Facebook page, I posted, I, I couldn't believe Bill Pulver came out ahead of their meeting to wrap up the season. And Bill Pulver said he has nothing to worry about. Gee, it's so, nice to have a job like that. Oh, <laughs> mate, where's, where's the pressure to say it was not a good enough year for our Wallabies fans and team and Michael Checker and I'll be sitting down to go through you know, what he's going to do to fix it. I know? can't believe that. Actually, I can believe they said that. But you can't have a result like that and just say the coach has got nothing to worry about. Uh, from a contracting point of view, he probably hasn't because yeah. he can go all the way through the World Cup in 2019. Which is, you know, make that point. You know, yeah. say, right, we're in, we're in boat with Michael Checker, but we need to see better results. You know, yeah. it, just, it just seems like not enough scrutiny. I've been on this before in many shows back that rugby is not just about the World Cup every four years. There are plenty of test matches in the meantime. Otherwise, the Blitters Eye Cup wouldn't count. I mean, you you wouldn't think you can't think about those events all the way down the track, can you? And try because you need interest in the game in the meantime. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, now you need to build that. It should be well down the track, and uh, I th- yeah, I think it should be year to year. I mean, there's so much rugby at the moment anyway, mm. um, and and people can actually get rugbyed out. So you need to kind of build that interest in there. If you're asking me about Checker, I I think he can. I think he's good. I'm a fan of Checker. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, I'm a pretty big fan of him as a as a Australian coach, mm. but at the same time, if I think he's done things that are wrong, no. I'm going to call him out. And I think he's done a fair bit wrong this year. Um, next year, he needs to, he needs to um, pick it up. Pick it up, hundred percent. It wasn't. It just wasn't good enough this year. There was a terrible record. Um, Australian Super Rugby. Wow. Mm. Poor year last year. I think we did a whole show on that, mate. Yeah. Well, we're going. <laughs> and can England keep out. going? The, the, uh, the English are interesting in that they've had such a good run. We saw old Dylan Hartley's trying to get himself out of Lions contention and out of England. England <laughs> Immediately contention. after playing for England, he was in strife being sent from the field. Yeah. Uh, so, but, but I think, you know, they're clearly in, in great shape, in great form. Eddie's got them humming. It's going to be a, a tougher Six Nations, though, than they had last year. I think the other teams look like they're struggling, but Scotland looked like they were going, OK, Wales were struggling. Island up against them, I think they might not make the record. All right, quickly, strike viewer comments of the week. So quick shout-outs this week, and if I get your name pronunciation wrong, just correct me underneath, but keep sharing, commenting, and subscribing. Thumbs up. Thank you very much. Sean and Edwards, uh, great comments. Lincoln Bunning, Tuari Senekalkiri, Darren Walker, um, Tu Mara Era, uh, Ace Tchaikovsky, uh, Stevie Biggs and Johnny, his mate. Thanks, fellas. Bill and Morris... Tony Masoi Togia, uh, Colin Townsend out of South Africa. He's keen on that South African show. We will get to it, mate. Thank you for, for joining in on the comments. Thanks, Colt. Off the Cuff Gaming, uh, Rauhiro X, 
And I think the last one was Biggest 23. He and I went back and forth on Andrew Slack and maybe the, the whinging in the Wallabies. That was a good chat. Ooh, Andrew Slack. He went right back to Andrew Slack, talked about whinging in the Wallabies. Ah. Yeah. Well, Slack, he, uh, he's a legend, though. He is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> that's about it. Uh, quick one. What would Homer Simpson say that's about it? your That's year? it? Yeah. That was... Yeah, that's it. I was just getting warmed up. Yeah, flying. it's flying. What would, what, what would Homer Simpson say to the Wallabies you? Eddie Jones? Um, He's got to have some comment about Eddie Jones. About uh, Eddie Jones. This is pretty good. Uh, <laughs> no pressure. Have you, have you no. done this for a while? I've not done it's, it's Ironically, it was all back here, and when I've moved to America, it hasn't. You moved on. It hasn't, yeah, it hasn't. But, yeah. um, but thanks for watching, guys. Uh, I'll be back with... No, I won't be back. Thank God this was the only time I do it with these stupid guys. Think they're so good. Is that, uh, it's, I've great. been out of practice. No, no, so, uh, I'm sorry to do that. I just had to. You're do not it, sorry though. at all. No, no, no. <laughs> all right, Max Davina, great to see you, mate. Thanks, Jiro. Great, great to see you, Ben. Yeah, yeah, I hope you're feeling better, mate. Max Davina, right. good, sprightly. Former Waratah and a host of teams in the Northern Hemisphere, um, and uh, coaching in a. What's your team? Well, this is actually my camps company. I'm yep. trying to develop rugby in America, SoCal Rugby Camps, so based in LA and San Diego. A lot of kids uh, down in that hotbed of rugby in uh, Southern California and doing some coaching uh, coaches, coaching the coaches as well and uh, getting into that. And Santa Monica Rugby is yeah. my club. Oh, good. On the beach there, yeah, so yeah. just living it up in the sun, you know. Mate, bring it home. We want to see US rugby grow. That's great to hear. Thank you. Yeah, and it's, it, as you said, sleeping giant, but... Uh, it's very disjointed at the moment, and uh, they just need to get their act together. And there's a new CEO, so people are pretty excited about what he might do with uh, USA Rugby. There he is, Mark Sabina, a future coach of the Eagles. <laughs> hey? I don't know about that. It'd uh, <laughs> be great I love to the see. Confidence, though. Good thanks, to see Jiro. you, Mark. Good to see you, buddy. Thanks, buddy. Ben Kimber, thanks for coming in, mate. Thanks, Good buddy. to see you. And uh, this is Juro Sen signing off. It's coming, the solution to South Africa's woes. Tune in, enjoy your rugby. We'll see you next week. Thanks for hanging in there. Just packing up in my casual gear and it's time for our Easter egg, a little surprise at the end of the show. And this is a very rarely seen, little known about this interview that Mark Stabina did while at the 1998 Commonwealth Games Village. Mark Stabina and the great Jonah Loma. Yeah, just coming over here now. <laughs> um, and another old sorrows, wasn't it? Jonah. <laughs> Jonah, mate, your thoughts on winning the gold? Is it your biggest achievement in rugby? I uh, don't know about the biggest, but uh, it's right up there. Right? What's the biggest year for you? Uh, uh, you've had done it a fair bit. Well, it's uh, winning all gold, actually. Three years in a row. This is down over here. Yeah. I know you can't, you might not remember, but um, Australian schoolboys, I was 5'8", 93. We played you guys at. Uh, <laughs> Speed bump. Uh, was it was it road or road? I can't remember yeah, where road it was. Uh, now you gave us a bit of a dust up, but um, can you remember the hit I pulled on you when you broke up and strung you around straight at me? How yeah, the ribs these days, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, I, I remember something really significant about that game. Actually, your number eight picked up the ball and came around the opposite side and looked at me and Andrew Blowers and thought, nah, I'm not running near. So he ran around the corner and ran into his taller market. And then he gave the ball to me. Mate, there's been a, a, just a general consensus around the village that uh, things would have been different if you were playing Australia in the final. What are your comments to that? Jonah, he's thinking. Maybe you would have had to settle for the silver had the Aussie boys got through and not oh, well, the Watching the handling of, the, of their bottle last night wasn't that great, so they didn't get alone in the rugby ball. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, just press standby while I ask him to step outside. <laughs>